pray together. Father, we thank you for the way that you work in our lives and for how we're able to come and and just learn more about who you are and the type of God you are. Father, we pray that we might know you even more as we hear from your word and how you work in David's life. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. That last song uh, reminds me, I was sharing in the first service about how John, in the Gospel of John, writes the story of Jesus and, and puts on display his I am statements, his statements that he is God in the flesh, but then also attaches those to the miracles that he does, right? With the, you know, feeding the 5,000 and, and uh, calming the waves and all of those miracles. And then at the very end of the gospel, he says, these things are written so that you might believe, right? There's a purpose why he wrote them. There's a reason why there are miracles that, that Jesus does is so that you might believe, right? Believe what? Believe that he's the son of God. And so the miracles that Jesus does is to prove to us that he is God in the flesh. And so that's part of why God does miracles is to show us who he is. So Now, on to our sermon. I want you to imagine for a moment that you have an opportunity to establish for yourself a new country. They decided to say, you know what, we're going to build this new country and you get to decide what it's going to be like. What kind of things would you want your country to be like? And what kind of leader, if it wasn't going to be you, or if it was going to be you, what kind of leader would you want to have? What kind of qualities would you want to have in them? Uh, Canada is known as a country of peace, order, and good government. People laugh at that, but that's actually what we say we're supposed to be like. We're supposed to have peace, order, and good government. I don't know if we always live up to that, um, but there's hope, right? There's always, there's always hope that we would be... Uh, that Switzerland is known as a country that's uh, diplomatic neutrality. There's, there's other countries around the world that are known for many different things. But what would your country uh, best be known for? Would you want to have a leader who's, you know, like a tyrant who presses down on the people and overtaxes them and makes them slaves? No, that's not something we're looking for. We want justice. We want someone who's loving, who's mercy, who serves and doesn't expect to be served. We all understand qualities, but why are those important qualities for someone who might be a leader? Well, Jesus um, teaches us these things, right, in the scriptures. We hear from Christ, and he talks about, you know, that he came to serve, not to be served, right? He, He comes as a person who is just and right. And that your king would be righteous. And where we get this idea is from what the Bible tells us about what it means to be part of the kingdom of God. You and I are Christians, belong to the kingdom of God. The kingdom that God designed is led by God himself. If you remember last week when we were first looking at the life of David, when the people saw, the the Israelites saw the other nations had kings, they came to Samuel and said, we want a king, we want a king. And God, who is, it was always meant to be a theocracy where God would be king, you have the situation where they have now rejected God as their king and wanted an earthly king. Well, guess what happens with the earthly king? Things don't work out. He becomes a bit of a tyrant. He, he oppresses the people. He takes them as slaves, as God had said would happen. He becomes murderous in his thoughts, right? And even though the Lord first put the Holy Spirit upon him, when he becomes disobedient to the laws of God, God removes his Holy Spirit from Saul. And so now God, we're in a situation where God is going to establish for himself a kingdom, a messianic kingdom, a king of anointed people. And we're going to take you back 3,000 years. 3,000 years to the time where God begins this messianic kingdom, where he anoints for himself his first earthly king, which is, which is going to be for this line that is going to continue on for all of eternity. And the reason why I'm saying it's 3,000 years ago is because it does happen almost exactly 3,000 years ago. Does anyone know what year this is? I'll get it. I'll get it. No. <laughs> does anyone know what year it is? 2024, right? So we're about 2,000 years after Jesus, just so you have in your mind. 2,000 years after Jesus, 1,000 years before Jesus is King David, just so you keep it in your mind so you can kind of keep that straight. We're talking about 1,000 years before Jesus is when we're talking about King David's life. So King David, we're going to look at 1 Samuel 16, 1 to 3, and we're going to look at the beginning of this new kingdom that is created by God. It's going to be part of this kingdom of God where God brings his anointed 
to be king. And so let's look at some of the qualities in the way that God chooses his king here. If you want to follow along, 1 Samuel 16, 1 to 13. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? So that's the situation we're in. God has rejected um, Saul as king. Saul will continue to be king even after David is anointed. But there will be this time where you have this kind of crossover where God has his new anointed king and Saul wants to hold on to power. He says to Samuel, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. So note the importance part here. God is choosing who is going to be king. And he's going to a small city or a small town outside of Jerusalem called Bethlehem. There's going to be this line, right? This line. We're foreshadowing someone here, right? Do you see the foreshadowing? So what's going to happen is he's going to choose one of his sons to be king because from the line of Jesse, we will get who is going to be the eternal king. But Samuel said, how can I go? Saul will hear about it and he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one that I indicate. Who's going to indicate? God himself is going to indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. And when he arrived in Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. I think it's always an interesting passage here where the people of Bethlehem see Samuel come. They want to know, is this a peaceful thing, a peaceful offering, or is the wrath of God going to come upon them? There's a bit, you know, when a prophet rolls into town, you're kind of like, "Uh uh-oh, right? You're not always expecting good when a prophet comes because prophets often will bring a message of dire, right? Like Jonah coming to the Ninevites, right? So it's like either you're going to repent or the Lord has bad news for you. But he's coming with good news. He's coming to anoint someone to be king. When they arrived, Samuel saw uh, Eliab and thought, surely the Lord anointed stands here before the Lord, right? So surely the Lord's anointed, the one who is, who is, this must be him, right? So this is the firstborn. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart, right? God is able to see the inside, where our hearts are, like our true feelings about things. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then said to Shammah, Pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There was still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. I learned something really interesting this week that I thought was uh, something that I'd share with you. In all of, of sort of ancient writings, right? So in, in all, of the, um, all of the ancient literature of all time, the life of David is actually the longest biographical picture we have of anybody. Like even other kings from other nations, nobody is, there's, not, there's not as much written as there is about King David. The Lord wants us to look at the life of King David. There's something about the life of King David that's important. And the the reality is because the life of King David is a bit of a foreshadowing to the king who is to come. The king who is going to be the eternal king, the perfect king, the king of kings. David's life kind of gives us an idea of what 
God is establishing here when he's establishing for himself this kingdom. So what this passage is about is truly that God is going to now find for himself. God is in search for a king who is going to be anointed, who is going to be chosen. And so these events, even though they take place 3,000 years ago, affect us even today. That you and I have a connection to this very point because at this moment, God is establishing for himself a person. And from this line, there is going to be an eternal kingdom that comes, which you and I will now become part of. Even though King David is 3,000 years ago, God's kingdom begins at this moment. And he is anointing this king. Now, this king is from the, the little town called Bethlehem. If you read through your scriptures, you notice that Jesse is the grandson of both Ruth and Boaz. Has anyone ever read the book of Ruth? We see the prophecy of Ruth here played out. In Ruth 4.11, you get this picture of this idea that the Messiah will come from her line, even though she is a Gentile. But because she's faithful to the Lord, you get this picture, this promise that God ends up giving. And so you have this family that is going to have, unlike Saul, who was a Benjamite, this family that is from the tribe of Judah, because we know even from scriptures into Genesis that the Messiah will come from the tribe of Judah. God is now setting up for himself. We know that the prophecy says that the one who is born in Bethlehem will become the king of kings, the Messiah, the anointed one, the very word that we use to describe Jesus as Christ in in Greek, Messiah, in Hebrew, both mean, when you say Jesus is the Messiah or Jesus is the Christ, did you know that that word actually means anointed? That he is the one who is anointed. And so we have David here who is now being anointed as king, but it is through the descendant of David that God gives the eternal covenant. What is the eternal covenant? It's a promise that comes to David that says, from your line, David, there will be always one who sits on the throne for all of eternity. So you stop and you read that and you're wondering, you're like, well, how is God going to create an eternal kingdom where the king is eternal? Because in our minds as humans, you're like, that's almost impossible, isn't it? Like, who lives forever? And so the scriptures tell us that even though David is in the ground decaying, there's still one from his line who comes to rule forever. Because if you know the history of Israel, you know that Israel as a nation doesn't stay established right? Ten tribes get taken away for all of eternity, for like we never see them again, and the other tribes go into exile. There's not a king on David's throne even after David's life. So what is God talking about here? He's going to establish a kingdom that is eternal, that has an eternal king, and that the person is going to be from Bethlehem, that he's going to be from the tribe of Judah, and unlike Paul, uh, unlike Saul who is a Benjamite, he is going to be one who is, who is serving his people. He's going to be a king who is righteous, who is just, who is merciful, and who is gracious. Who is that? You and I, hindsight, we know it's, that's correct, it's Jesus, right? So, here they come. We get into this ceremony where they stand before um, Samuel, and Jesse brings out all of his sons. And I always think this is an interesting thing, because we get, a, we get the opportunity to see how God sees us, right? So God doesn't just see our appearance, you can't get up in the morning and, and look good for God. You can't fake it with God because guess what? God already knows what you're thinking. He knows where your heart is, and he always knows what we're like. And that can be a scary thing sometimes, but it does teach us about what our God is like and his abilities. And then we get in verse 7 that God doesn't look at a man's appearance, but he looks at a man's heart. I would probably say that's true of women as well. You guys aren't skating by on this. Samuel worked through all seven sons. And the interesting thing here, I think, is Jesse, when he comes and he asks, you know, bring your sons because we're going to pick a king from your sons, he doesn't even send for David. Where's David? He's out in the fields looking after the shepherd. Or he's shepherding the sheep. Does that maybe give you an allusion to who might come as a good shepherd? Right? For his people? So he doesn't even send for him. Jesse doesn't even think David is, has the, the kingship material. David's older brothers don't even think that David could possibly be a king. Do you remember when he comes to see them when they're about to fight uh, Goliath and the Philistines? Do you remember that story? And they're like, you're just here to gawk and look around. You're, you know, you're, even, um, even Saul never viewed David as a king. He never sees David as a king. He doesn't even see him as kingly material. 
Jesse, his own father, doesn't. Goliath doesn't see David as a future king. He calls him a stick. That's not something you call a, a king, is it? He says, you're a stick. The only one who actually sees it is Jonathan, who's his best friend, who is Saul's son. Jonathan sees it. Even though Jonathan is in line to be king, he, later, he recognizes that David is actually the one who is anointed by God to be king. So where does that then bring us? After they bring David there, Samuel hears from the Lord and says, here's the one that I've chosen. Right? The anointed one of God is chosen. An important factor, right? He's chosen. And after he is anointed, it's verse 13 that we focus on. What ends up happening after the Lord anoints him? There is something that happens here that is of key importance to us. So Samuel, in verse 13, so Samuel took the horn of oil and he anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, what happened? The spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Right? The spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. So, this is where I want to sidetrack for a little bit. We all know David, and when you read this story, we know that David is chosen by God, that he is anointed by God. That's one of the factors, right? God gives him the Holy Spirit, so the very Spirit of God now dwells in David. God gave Saul the Holy Spirit, but when Saul becomes disobedient and doesn't follow after the Lord, the Lord actually removes the Holy Spirit from Saul. Now, the idea of what the Holy Spirit is that God dwells among his people in his king, right? And that's how he's going to lead. But the problem is when you and I begin to read through David's life, David is faithful to the Lord for quite a period of time until he reaches the top. And then the fall happens, right? Right, the fall happens. He becomes a murderer and he becomes an adulterer. And you might look at that and go, well, why is it that Saul is rejected, but David is kept? Is it because David is a better person? It doesn't mean to have a heart after God, mean that you're a good person and Saul is bad? There is not a, there's not a good and bad thing here. Everyone is bad. Right? It's not like David is, is good and Saul is bad. But there's something else that happens with David's life. After he kills Uriah the Hittite, and after he takes Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, there's something different that happens. Because the Holy Spirit stays with David, David has a fear now that he has sinned against the Lord. He says this in Psalm 51:11. He says, Do not cast me from your presence, Lord. This is David himself writing. Do not cast me from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. He repents. The Holy Spirit works in him. He repents. He is fearful of God's presence leaving him because the presence of God is what matters most to David. And so God is being merciful and gracious to David by continuing to leave his Holy Spirit with him. But it's the Holy Spirit that even opens David's heart to the fact that he would repent. If you read through Saul's life, Saul doesn't repent for his disobedience against the Lord. He doesn't do that. That's the only difference. It's not that David is good and Saul is bad. They're both bad. The only difference is when David does wrong, when he sins, what does he do? He returns to the Lord. And so David's life is an example even for us. Right? The forgiveness of sins is still offered to you and I through Jesus Christ. Even when we sin, there is forgiveness of sin that's offered in Christ. Right? So when we do wrong against the Lord. The Holy Spirit dwells in us as believers. The Holy Spirit prompts us to repent, to come back to the Lord. And so from that day on, God is using his Holy Spirit in David for it to accomplish his purposes. Now, are there consequences for David's sin? Most definitely. We're going to look at that. David's family turns against him. David's son Absalom wants to be king over David. There's a number of things. There's, there's a, a, a rape that happens in David's household, be, partly because of judgment that's against David's family. And we'll talk about the fallout of, and David's son dies from Bathsheba, right? So there's, there's a lot of fallout for the sin. I'm not saying that there's no consequences. There's consequences, but the difference is David does not lose the Holy Spirit. He does not lose his pre the presence of God in his life. So as God shows, once again, 
that he is chosen by God, David, that he is given the Holy Spirit, that he dwells among us, we now get to this place where as David has now received the Holy Spirit, that means from that moment on, David's life is perfect. Nothing ever goes wrong. No, that's not true, right? We all know the story. Even after David receives the Holy Spirit, things with Saul. Saul calls him to play the harp for him. But then he becomes a fugitive. And then even after he becomes a fugitive with Saul, you know, Saul tries to kill him on multiple times. So if you look through the history of the Bible, whenever the Holy Spirit comes and dwells upon someone, the, the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, just so you know, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament will dwell on someone for a period of time until God accomplishes what he needs to. To be anointed means to do the work of God. There's anointing that actually even happens with furniture in the temple. Right? Because when something is set aside, whether it's the menorah for the, for the lighting of the candles, or whether it's the, the table or the tabernacle, they're, they're all anointed for God's work, right? So oil is put on them. When a person is anointed and they receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwells on Saul for a period of time. But when Saul is disobedient, God removes his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't, isn't poured out upon everybody. But there's a promise that one day the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out upon those who come to the Lord, who receive Christ as Savior. And so for you and I, as believers, we're now living in a, in a time where the kingdom of God is being established. And the kingdom of God that is established, if you want to be part of the kingdom of God, there is a requirement for how the Holy Spirit then works in each one of our lives. But also recognize when you receive the Holy Spirit, it doesn't mean that your life is going to be perfect from now on. In fact, because God's Spirit now lives in you, things can become more difficult for you. Pretty good salesman, aren't I? But things can become more difficult for you because now you stand against this world, right? You stand against the, the spirit of this world. You stand against the culture of this world. When you're a Christian, not everything that happens in this world is appropriate for us. And so recognize when the spirit is in us, we now see the world differently. But here's then where this comes to fruition. The fulfillment of what happens here on the beginning of this prophecy Takes, the, takes place then, not only in the life of Jesus Christ, but in our lives as well. So the one who is anointed by God at King David at that time, King David sits on the throne and he promises David that God promises David that there will be one who comes from you, who will sit on the throne for all of eternity, who will be eternal, a king who is eternal, who will sit on the throne for eternity. And so where does God then establish that? He establishes that in his anointed one, his son, when he sends Jesus Christ. And listen to these two passages, Acts 10, 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit, right? So Jesus at his baptism receives the Holy Spirit. It's not that Jesus doesn't have the Holy Spirit prior to his baptism, but you and I have a visual sort of thing of seeing the Holy Spirit come in a light and land upon Christ. The Holy Spirit is and power, and how he went around doing good things and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. So we see that even the disciples are proclaiming that Jesus is the anointed one, the Christ, the Messiah, the promised one who was to come in the line of David. Jesus also proclaims this about himself. Luke 4, 18, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind and to release the oppressed. For you and I as believers, you and I then are now through Christ given an opportunity to enter into the kingdom that Jesus Christ establishes that is eternal with him as the eternal king. Because listen to this statement, because you and I have all heard this statement before. Every one of us, right? When Jesus comes, he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you. And here's the promise that comes in the book of Acts. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. How are we forgiven of sins? Because Christ dies on the cross and pays for our sins. So here's the promise. Is everyone, come and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of what? The Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that was put upon David, where David was anointed, is now offered to you. You are now also anointed in the Holy Spirit. 
the same spirit that that day anointed David. Right? The oil, there's nothing magic in the oil. It was just a sign, a symbol of the fact that David was going to receive the spirit of God. But you and I, when we go through the waters of baptism, there's nothing magic in the water. But you and I, there is this picture, right? That when we go into the water, our sins are washed away. We are anointed. We are baptized. To be baptized means to be immersed. And we are immersed by the Holy Spirit. And when we're immersed by the Holy Spirit, the visual of being immersed by the Holy Spirit is the fact that we have gone through the waters of baptism. It's a picture. It's a symbol of the fact that we have been anointed. That you and I now are part of those who are anointed by God to be part of his kingdom. Because the anointed ones of God, right, are chosen by God. It says you are God's chosen people. You are now the royal priesthood, right? Peter calls us. You are now the royal priesthood. You are chosen by God. We are chosen by God. We have been anointed and received the Holy Spirit in our lives. And because of that, we now belong to the kingdom that the king has established, And the king that we worship and that we serve is the one who has poured out his spirit upon us, and that is Jesus Christ. So, how do I belong to the kingdom? I must receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I must repent of my sins. The ability to repent is given to us by the Holy Spirit. The ability to have faith in Christ that he died on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins is given to us by the Holy Spirit. The day that the Holy Spirit illuminated us to the fact that Jesus Christ is our King, now means that not only is He my Lord and my Savior, but He's also my Messiah, the one who is anointed, that He is the Christ, that He is the one chosen by God to establish this kingdom. And what is His kingdom like? His kingdom is a kingdom of justice and mercy and grace. It is a kingdom where there is forgiveness of sins. It is a kingdom, and we could go on for probably the next 20 minutes if all of you just showed, showed, shouted out a characteristic of who Christ is and what his kingdom is like. And so that is the offer to you today. If you have never received Christ as Lord and Savior, then the offer to you today is to receive it. Repent of your sins. Believe that Christ's death on the cross paid for your sins. Repent and believe every single one of you for the forgiveness of your sins, and be baptized, which is just a symbol of showing that you have received the Holy Spirit, and you will receive the gift, the greatest gift, which is the very presence of God in your life. And when you receive that, you now become part of this greater kingdom, this kingdom that Christ established that many years ago. Everyone enters into the kingdom of God the same way. We all enter through the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who invites us all. Many are called, but not everyone is chosen. And so you and I, as Christians, when we are chosen, that is not something that we take lightly. Now, that the Holy Spirit is in our life, that means we never sin again. No, but the Holy Spirit reminds us that we are to come to the one who's forgiving, the one that we can come and repent to. And because of him, you and I now have eternal life. We do that, we come to that because of one person, God in the flesh, and his name is Jesus, our King, the Anointed One, the Messiah. 3,000 years ago, God started it. He's finishing it even today in your life. You're part of that kingdom. That's part of what it means to be a Christian. Let's pray. Lord, you do great works among us, and you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the anointed one, the King of Israel, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Lord, we even know in scriptures that you were, that the prophecy of who you would be and how that would be fulfilled, that you would come from a small town called Bethlehem, that you would come from the tribe of Judah, that you would come to establish this eternal kingdom where you have invited not only the the Jews, but also the Gentiles to come to you and to worship you as king. That you are the one who is anointed above all and that you are greater than all and that we come and we worship you today. And Lord, we thank you for that and we pray that in Jesus' name and all God's people said.